Uh, hello everyone, uh, good evening. Uh, this evening we joined by Professor Ben Simons, um, who's going to give us a talk on theories of granting morphogenesis. Uh, Professor Ben Simons is the Hartfield Smith Chair of Physics here at the Cavendish, and his research focuses mostly on uh, condensed matter, condensed matter physics, with uh, particular applications in uh, biophysics, uh, cell, stem cell and developmental bio. Um, uh, in the past, you, uh, Ben has worked on ultra cold atom gases, uh, quantum coherence, uh, quantum phase coherence effects, and um, in biophysics, uh, he's worked on genetic lineage and on cell and progenitive uh, state in normal metastasis species. So, so how do you do? I'm going to have to show you that band. <laughs> first, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Second of all, thanks a lot for coming along. Well, it's a big turn. Um, third of all, I, it's a bit, you know, please don't follow my career. Huge, <laughs> huge mistake. So, so what I need to do is that. So now. So now, so now I have a, a, a mouse lab in the Yosemite Institute, we have a climate change and animal models and stuff. So I have this nice kind of systemic existence. Um, um, and so, so what I try to do that day uh, uh, is to give a talk which is which trying to get to get some insight. It's not going to focus on this specific, it's not going to be a million million things, but it's going to focus on a specific level where I'm um, um, I think I think I should have shared about how insight science and concepts from physics is my science and then it happens in the biology. That's that's my plan. It focuses on science of the challenge of normal genesis. Um so because it's like you know we 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 back and they always all start with um uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're just just uh, uh, four slides, uh, slides of uh, uh, philosophy and then we'll yeah. get to the so, um, so what's the one challenge in the development of biology? So this is, so this is you know, what I'm going to say is our challenge, not what I'm going to say is our challenge. Can you change this? Is that because I'm going to make it? Yeah. Development of biology. It's really, it's really encapsulated by this. So, so oh. how the pro programs which are encoded as a study as so cells also belong to uh, genes and gene products and individual cell cells as they say gene chickens are linked to the at that molecular scale. How can we link that to the emergence of organization and function which went through systematic dependence? So we know the emergence of this complex issue involves collective cells and cell fail specification. So how can we bridge between these uh, between this and this molecular scale cell health and the man system? And this raises all the not questions just to the way you can look at for mathematical assistance and the online side is it's been dictated with our understanding. But then, you know, what's the right language to articulate the mechanism of mechanistic understanding? You want to understand the other mechanisms that facilitate the development of the organ. Where, where should we look for that answer? 
so you know this is an obvious question for a physical scientist a physicist but of course my biological colleagues know instinctively what the answer is so, so everybody understands that everybody can learn that part. So, exactly, we can understand something. If you want to understand the individual genes, the individual enzymes, and to regulate the state's pressure, but perhaps you see some of all the sort of lines that are not over there. It may be a one to one task, yeah. It may be not a great place to start. So, so you know, this must be like a this might be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, okay. Lots of other lessons we can learn from physics. Okay. So the next couple of slides, if you've not seen them before, you will see them soon. Too, too many times, it will be irritating, but it's useful to see. Okay. So other lessons we can learn from physics. Well, in, you know, in a certain sense there is, right? So, so if we think about the physics of uh, condensed matter, terrestrial matter, we actually know all of the microscopic ingredients. We know that matter is made up of electrons and ions. And we know the fundamental interactions that act between electrons and ions, just Coulomb interaction. And we know fundamentally the behavior of that system will be described by Schrodinger's equation of quantum mechanics. So it all looks very simple. If we just vary stoichiometry and temperature, we actually have, uh, and this is a very mischievous slide from Bob Laughlin's Nobel Symposium, so Laughlin of quantum whole thing, uh, we have a theory of everything, right? This is his joke. The theory of everything. We just have to solve this equation. We just solve this equation, we get the theory of steel, plastic, paper, everything. And of course, you can see the uh, uh, immediately see the flaw in, in this argument. And this was articulated in a beautiful essay, which if you never read it, you should, from another, um, uh, well, local, he was in Cambridge for many years, Phil Anderson. He wrote a very beautiful essay in the early 70s. And in that essay, he wrote many interesting things. And what he points out, there you can see the ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. So even though we have a very exact microscopic description, that description is actually, in effect, almost completely useless. And he coined this phrase, which you'll hear many times in physics, more is different, that one, two, three, infinity doesn't work. Something new happens, you have emergent behaviors. And so what we've learned in physics, what we've learned in physics is that all of the complexities that we might have at the microscopic scale, often, not always, translate, translate to robust emergent collective behaviors at the mesoscopic scale. So for example, when atoms condense into a solid, into a crystal, there emerge new collective excitations in the form of lattice vibrations or phonons. There are new collective emergent behaviors. Uh, or another example, when electrons condense as pairs, then they form, uh, 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 they condense into the ground state and they start having properties like superflow. Okay. This is an emergent behavior which you can't extrapolate from one, two, three, infinity. And so what we've learned in physics is that rather than trying always to start with a microscopic description, sometimes it's better to focus on the phenomenology, to focus on the emergent behaviors, which are often described by minimal theories, which means universal involving very few degrees of freedom, right? 
uh, involving just a few composite variables, which may be incredibly complex functions of the microscopic degrees of freedom, but we don't care. We can work with these simple kinds of hydrodynamic theories. This is a very general principle in physics. So can we just translate this approach to biology? This seems cool, let's just do this. We can apply this way of thinking. Let's just focus on emergent behaviors. But in physics, in condensed matter physics, the emphasis is usually on equilibrium or near equilibrium behaviors of inanimate compounds, where these principles, they work very well. They work well for fundamental reasons because where things uh, matter is usually associated with divergent lens scales and so on. In biology, we're dealing with systems which are massively out of equilibrium. And these are evolved systems. They may be very special. And of course, they're animate, the whole mark of living systems. So they may not work, but it might be a good place to start. So my whole talk is to try to emphasize that actually this way of thinking can work very well in a very specific problem. So what we do in my group is that we place emphasis on looking at the collective dynamics of a statistical ensemble of entities, on, uh, might be molecules, it might be cells, it might be tissues, it might be communities. And we use concepts from uh, physics to see whether we can abstract mechanistic insights. So the aim of this talk, I wanna use one example, many examples we could choose, but I wanna choose one example, which is branching morphogenesis. And I want to illustrate the role of self-organization, emergent behaviors in development. The important here of tailoring the questions to the correct level of abstraction. The utility of theoretical phenomenology in trying to understand this problem and gain predictive insights. And I hope, although this is a very controversial thought, by the way, lots of my competitors would disagree, but we end up with a framework which I think provides some unifying principle in, in biology. So to get to these points, We've got to do a bit of biology. So here comes my biology. I'll pass that quite quickly. We, we need it. Okay. Branching morphogenesis. So as you know, or can imagine, that if we need to sustain life, multicellular organisms need to exchange nutrients, enzymes, waste products uh, with the environment. If you're a single cell organism, just the surface of the cell is probably sufficient to meet those demands. But in multicellular organisms, it's a problem. And we have to develop strategies to maximize surface areas. And there are different ways to do that. So for example, you know, here's a very old, I don't know why I chose such an old one, an ancient image of the small intestine, which, is, which have these uh, villi-like structures that, that, in, that uh, project into the gut lumen to create very large surface areas for, uh, um, for absorption and uh, uh, and secretion. And of course, another obvious example of branched organs. So there's the, on the right is a very old image of the lung. So other, in other tissues, these, the epithelial organized around these, uh, these hugely ramified complex um, uh, branch structures to maximize uh, exchange surfaces. So we come back to our question, how is information encoded at the molecular and cellular scale how does that translate into organization and function of these complex branch tissues? So that's the problem I want to try to address in the, in the 30 minutes or so that I've got. So we'll start with a specific example. Uh, and actually this is historically where we, we started, this is maybe five years ago. And the problem is uh, branching morphogenesis in the, of the mammary gland epithelium. So the mammary gland is a very branch structure. Uh, and it initiates along what the biologists call this is ventral epidermis. It initiates this E here is embryonic day, embryonic day 12 or so. And it initiates a little placode and that placode grows into just a tiny little rud rudimentary tree. And then after birth, that little rudimentary tree grows through a process of tip driven branching morphogenesis. The cells in the tip uh, uh, elongate the, the, the duct, and then they branch, and then they elongate, and then they branch. And if we zoom into a tip, so all proliferation is in the tip, then we can see that there's a complex structure. 
there. We don't need to go into this complex structure. So we've got proliferative cells in the tip, they're called terminal end buds, and they give rise to this simple stratified epithelium, which comprises basal and luminal cells. Okay. Now this growth process is supported by a progenitor population, which are known as mammary stem cells in the tips that drive this repetitive process of end bud bifurcation and ductal elongation. So how does the system regulate these complex branching patterns? And there you can see an image. So this is uh, this keratin 14 is staining ductal cells. And you can see at three and a half weeks of age, you can see that branching pattern forming from the origin. At five weeks, it's starting to invade that. This yellow dotted line is, the, is known as the fat pad. It invades into this region. And by eight weeks, it's filled this region with this complex branching structure. So how does it know how to grow in that way? What, what regulates that patterning? So let's look at some clues here. So during puberty, if we uh, use a proliferation marker, so a marker which marks proliferative cells, we can see that all proliferation is localized in these tips. It's only the tips that are growing. And when cells move out of the tips, they stop proliferating. Okay. So how do these stem cells, how do they integrate fate choice with all of these collective cell movements with pattern redundancy on network? What is the identity? What's the multiplicity of those cells? And what is their lineage potential? And are these programs conserving other uh, developmental contexts? Right, so where should they start? Now, now, you know, this sounds like, like you know, sounds like a minority problem. This is a huge field. There are more people working on this problem the work more in this And just to give you some idea of the scale, why do people care, care, they care because they want to understand this problem because then they may learn about how these decisions go wrong in tumor genesis, and then they might find like, you know, different ways of treating it. So, so you know, these, these basic questions are hugely interesting things for a community to take a very large community. So where should we start? So the whole world, Starts out with molecules, let's look at a lot of the important genes, signals, and pathways by cells. But we're not going to do that because that's too complicated. We're only running physicists. So let's look, look at the microscope. So we've teamed up um, with, with uh, our colleagues in the Netherlands, friends of Amarina. I'll highlight it here. Linda Lea, she was a graduate student, she now got her own group. Uh, so she was a graduate student who did you know, all of the work. So what you can see on the left, left is uh, the man with that pad, you can sort of see the filament of the structure, uh, and then the list of many of that structure. Yeah. So there's the one example of this branch. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, she reconstructed uh, that uh, branch of network work in the following topology. So what, so what we can, can see, see is to generate that branch structure, I'm not sure of the topology on the right side, right. then I think the one on the left. Actually, it does does the, the producer just and does the maps. So you can see that to generate this structure, the, the tissue is called the dots have gone through 230 around the branch. And you can see that some of the subtree truth line, right? And some of them are huge. Where does Where the same result of that flex doesn't come from? The second thing is that if you look at the abundance of inverts that are still proliferative, that's the minimum tree that we have. So some of these tests stop, stop growing. So what does this mean? You know, are there cells with very, very low potential? That's the answer I've ever had. Or are there intrinsic factors that need to be the collective decision decision process? So again, we get all those things. And the first thing that we know is that when you look at the average width of the double cell, it's on the front of the branch left left. The branch levels are quite unique in the tree. The branch levels are quite unique in the branch left left. It's kind of flat, right? It's kind of flat, The average length of the double cell is kind of flat, right? The proliferative activity of the double cell is still proliferative. It's kind of flat, right? So everything here looks in very shape. It looks like the potency of the tip. The beginning is the same thing as the CD, but at the end, yeah, and it looks like stop. So, so what's the source of all the balls? 
Now, some of the time, I was not surprised. It's always the only It's always the only way. Some of them are often just in the it's like just there. And then you mentioned Libra. So you think you can get that access. Anything when you send something out there. Okay, okay. So, so in the Edward and Nathan, I said, it's really, really nice stuff. You know how it has a whole lot of stuff. Edward was super silly. silly. He's, he's, he's now going to go into the MP. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, 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 this is the Nature does. If we look at the distribution of branch lengths, 
It's very exponential. It means that there's no memory between the consensus and the Poisson process. There's no memory between the consensus and the process. But if we look at also at the topology, here's the circulation, the sex environment, uh, and, now, and now we can measure the size distribution, the, the average determination probability, the system of probability. It, it does really well. How many parameters do we have in this model? We've got one. We've got the ratio of the branch rate of the elongation rate. We don't fit that and measure it. So this is a zero that in that sense. There's zero parameter fit. So, so it looks like the development of this tissue follows from branching and annihilating random walk. What about the growth dynamics? I mean, that's the end point. This is finished. Like, what about the dynamics of growth? Okay, so, so now the branching and annihilating random walk is, is not completely alien to physicists. See by physicists actually being a lot, a lot in the context of statistical physics. And the person on the right here is a kind of hero of mine. Uh, this is John Cardi. He's um, going strong now in Berkeley. He was for many years in Santa Barbara, and then he was professor in Oxford. He's a British professor in Oxford for many years. And John Carter is a very interesting guy. He's a person who was always on the periphery of statistical field theory and high energy physics and did some of the most beautiful work in that area. And he has worked for a long time on many different topics. One of the topics he worked on was with branching and annihilating random walks. But it isn't this one. This is a tip tip annihilation. And actually, the process that we have is more analogous to another work that he did. On epidemic models and percolation. It was 1985, a long time ago. I was a student in 1980. We've in the audience here. Okay. So, epidemic models. Why is it an epidemic model? Well, let's look at this model. Okay. So, our branch of analyzing random walk, if we can think of those tips as being like infectious agents. Because infectious agents are moving around and diffusing, and they can multiply. That's branching. And, and as, they more, as they move, they, they infect sites. So they leave behind these infected sites, a trail of infected sites. Those are in our inactive ducts. And when this infectious agent meets that it, it recovered site, it's killed. So this is an epidemic model. It falls into that class of epidemic models. And we can go back and look at what uh, John Cardi and Peter Brasberger did in those days. And this, this system is an interesting one. It's a non-equilibrium system. Uh, and it has its phase transition in the system. And the phase transition is a transition between a situation where the probability that you escape to infinity is zero, and the probability becomes non-zero. So that transition of complete annihilation to escape is a critical point. Biology is positioned quite far from that critical point. And so we can get away without thinking about these very fancy things. So what's sketched there, I'm not going to go through it, is a, an action for this statistical field theory. But we can do something simpler because we're far from this critical point. Okay, so let's look at, let's, let's make a little theory for this problem. So what we have is we've got active tips with a density A, and those active tips can diffuse. They can also branch, and they can also get annihilated, and they're annihilated on inactive ducts with density I. And the inactive ducts, they have no dynamics, they're just fixed, and they're born from elongation, and they can also annihilate. So if we just rescale those equations, then there is, there's the one parameter in the system, the ratio of branch rate to elongation rate. And these equations are very famous equations in reaction diffusion systems. They're known as Fisher KPP equations. And if we solve those equations, what does it look like? It looks like this, right? So what this little model predicts is that the active tips uh, nucleate into a soliton front and that soliton front, that's the bump, moves at constant speed 
through the network, leaving behind a constant density of inactive ducts. So that's what comes from this Fisher KPP dynamics. And so now we can understand why this system balances duplication and, uh, and termination. The reason is that if you're an active tip at the front, every time you bifurcate, on average, one tip pioneers new territory and the other one collides with the trailing network and is annihilated. That's why this system drives itself to this uh, critical point. And you can see from the little uh, moving on the line. So is there any evidence uh, for this? Well, here is the, the, the thing on the right, there's data. You can see that's a proliferation marker. You can see the active tips uh, are localized on the boundary of this invading network. And sure enough, if you measure the distribution of active tips and then active ducts, it actually fits very well. And it even fits very well with a soliton-like front. The soliton is you know, exponential tails on each side of the soliton, uh, and actually the ratio, uh, you know, the, the, the exponential is broader on the, at the back than it is on the front, and the ratio uh, of one minus square root two works quite well. And if we actually measure the velocity of the front moving through the networks, it's not our data. Actually, none of it's my data, it's all Yakko's, but anyway, this isn't even Yakko's data. You know, it's more or less constant speed, right? So this, this is more or less a constant speed. Another feature of this model, it's a critical theory, is that it's predicted to have what's known as giant density fluctuations. So in statistical physics, it giant density fluctuations. This is a little bit like um, if you've ever looked at fractal uh, physics of diffusion limited aggregation, you can see that in this process, this branching process, you can accidentally seal off a very large open area. And once you sealed it off, you can't fill it in anymore. So you get very large density fluctuations in the network. And if, and if you look at the fluctuation as a function of an abnormal number, then in fact, what is this model model it is, is that it's actually the model with, 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 with a critical amount. So if that exponent was one half, that's just random. Central limit. Then. But here we get an exponent that looks like two thirds. We don't know if it's two thirds. It might not be two thirds, it might be some other number. Right? But again, theory and experiment uh, agree very nicely. And one of the puzzles in this field for a long time was that people were asking what are the morphogens, what are the chemical signals that direct the growth, that, that tell these uh, tips where to go. But you can see that in this dynamics, you don't need that because the dynamics itself chooses a direction. And in fact, if we, you know, if we get directly growth without morphogens, if you look at the directed growth of this system, it's an emergent phenomenon. Okay, so what's the identity multiplicity in the niche potential? Now we can drop down a notch and ask what's happening at the cellular scale. I'm definitely not going to do that, and I didn't, right? But I just want to put in a word here. So one of the things that we can do in the lab is we can activate fluorescent reporters in individual cells. And we can look at what cells and their progenies are doing over time. And what we find, just to give you the punchline on this, is that the enzymes they form a niche environment which support these renewing cells. And those renewing cells act cooperatively to drive this process of ductal elongation and bifurcation. And when those renewing cells out meet factors, it's TGF beta for the biologists, when they meet TGF beta, those cells fall out. All right. All right. So are these programs conserved in other branch organs? Okay. So let's, let's, let's turn to kidney. Kidney has a much more complicated uh, initial branch process. Uh, but still, it gets to a phase of these projects from the And you can, you can see, see that there, there, these are uh, uh, weak reconstructions of mass of the embryonic body state 6.5. Again, again, since the orthogonal kind of genetics is three dimensional. Three -dimensional. So is, is there a statistical basis on branching organisms in kidney? So, so, you know, the physicists, and we have a hammer, and they've got the most money in the house, so that's just. 
So now we can turn to the three dimensional version of the astronomy of our lighting moment. Now, so now we need one more parameter because, as well as, well as having the ratio of branching or elongation right, obviously we could just in this, right? You know, we, we, we have to, we've got to now introduce a length scale of x. We need to introduce a length scale, scale, which is how close do I need to get and terminate? So we've got one more parameter. But if we take this branching and rise and around the wall, again, if you did see the sort, of, sort of five rises of trophies to q equals one half probability, if we take that, then actually this model can predict very well what, what we see in the experimental data. Now, the number of branches on the function are regular enough for us not to develop that in high points. It's the chance of the tip tip. So, I understood the same range range. Start on this is the three degrees. Uh, uh, and indeed, indeed if, if, we, if we look at the fitting of this little parameter, we find the least peak inside of this phase in three months. So, so you know, you know, again, again, this is not a model which now can have two plans. Yeah, one more right, 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 so it seems like it's about the number of mathematics. It was also a paradigm of just just some simple and branching analysis. Okay, so are they the other exceptions? It's all like this. I've never branched issues like this. And I can open it there to put it in the exception too. I'm conscious of the thing. But let's 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 do that. So, so now we're now so we're now in my lab. Now in my lab. This is going to be the short trip. Now now in my lab. So so I I have a I have a I'm going to yeah yeah. I'm just working on developing a lot of my my lab slides like every other project for you all to those who have. And again, this is this trip. This is the system which is now now in the main open of those two processes that are drawn more together. Just it gives me more 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 insight to what they say to me. That's not like that. Just the movement on the right is more important than the other. How can this issue go this way? Excellent plan. If you can use that, the argument is very understandable. So it supports this last logic that undergoes those multiple platform modification, and then as well as all the sorts of stuff. You can use the one because this is a special solution for us. So it's more being ran around by the network. The bench bench can be told up with tissue issue and very very complex. So, so, so we have this set of our state management team. Now, it's not like that, not like that, but it's not like that. This is the model we find here. There's, there's the ammonia. Um, there, there is a uh, slightly library plan. We still want one part of the library plan. It's under the little bit of the summer sun being living level. Uh, uh, this is something that we gave us in quite a nice amount of time. So it's good. It forms the large tank tank like structure you can see it in the main lane and the exact same shit that I have there. And for the EA 2.5, the EA 2.5, that's the kind of most common to run the mice on. The network is complete. There's no more branching after that. So some of the money segmented all of this. I had a postdoc trying to automate all this segmentation, but in the end, uh, there's nothing but for the poor uh, uh, experimentalist to do it manually, and she did that. Uh, and here are her branching trees, large subtrees, small sub subtrees, and we thought this is all straightforward, it's just going to be the same old, same old. But there were some things that were puzzling, and one thing that was puzzling is, is that the ducts continue to broaden over time, which is a bit weird. So we don't have that flat stationary behavior we saw in the mammary gland and they also are changing their lens so we took our simple kind of birthday process type model of coin flip and it's hopeless it doesn't get anywhere close so what's going on and the clue was here that in this tissue the gland actually is expanding exponentially fast okay over a short amount of time the gland itself is inflating. And so what we reasoned, uh, what we reasoned uh, was, the, was the following. What we reasoned is that now we still have this branching annihilating random wall, but it's taking place on a background which is constantly inflating. So when a tick becomes inhibited because of steric constraints, when everything expands, 
it's able to resume branching. So this is Inacio, postdoc in the lab. He just literally started his own lab in Chile um, uh, in the summer. So, okay, so he postulated that actually you have this uh, recovery that his tips can resume branching. Um, uh, and indeed, when you look at the, uh, when you fit that model to the data, you have this inflationary type process, uh, then in the end, it works pretty well. It works pretty well. So we still have that same paradigm, but we have a paradigm where branches get inhibited by steric constraints. But then as everything expands, uh, branching can resume. Okay. And again, I'm not going to go through this, but we can make a, an analog of the Fisher KBP dynamics on, on that back. Okay, maybe I won't. So just to comment, so Lamonia is a cell biologist. She joined my lab. Her interest was not in branching morphogenesis. She wanted to understand what are the cell fate decisions that are taking place. And actually what she did was to label cells and then look at the cells and their progenies, clones, on this branching network. It was really a, a, a tour de force. And I won't go through that. Okay, so are there alternative space filling strategies? So let's look again at what we found. So in this branching analyzing random walk, it's a really simple system. We've got a system where you just make local decisions based on local information, and you make that repetitively. There's nothing too uh, much to regulate here. And it reasonably well fills the space. But the problem is that it's stochastic, uh, and you get these large voids, uh, and so, you know, you have single trees that may dominate. There are very large length scale fluctuations and it may be a bit inefficient. It's what nature has chosen in some cases. But maybe you want situations where you've got a much more efficient space filling. And there are ways to do that, of course. You can generate fractal like structures, which are perfectly space filling. But biologically, this is very expensive because now what you have to do is you've got to have some rule which is constantly changing over time. And the more moving parts you have, the more things that can, can go wrong. So does nature exploit those kinds of things? Well, actually, yes. So if you look at the mouse lung, the early phases of branching are highly stereotyped. And that's because perhaps in the lung, you can't afford or you can't afford for these chance voids to appear. And so you better encode something which is much more structured, much more space filling. Anyway, we got excited about this question uh, in the context of what happens in human. Uh, uh, and so I'm working with a French lab. I've got a shared student with Hélène Chateaudal. And what you can see there is the segmentation of human fetal lung, one example, many, many examples now. And we're beginning to look at what the branching patterns are in the human lung. And what's interesting in human is that we see a lot more evidence for stochasticity. It looks much more like in human, you don't exploit those geometric structures uh, that emerge in early mouse branching morphogenesis. But this is, um, this is a work in progress. What about other branch structures? Uh, you know, as I said, you know, I'm a nail. Um, so, so the obvious thing to think about, we thought, this is myself and Edouard several years ago, is, uh, you know, what about trees? Like it turns out we were crazy. We were crazy in multiple ways. Um, uh, it's not at all, and it's not a called dichotomous branching, by the way. We were so stupid, we didn't realize that. Uh, but we thought, you know, what about trees? And actually what's kind of fun is that when we dug into that literature, we actually found that those trees on the top aren't, aren't trees. Those trees on the top are actually generated by a computer. Uh, and there was a group in, a very brilliant group in Calgary, I won't try to pronounce the name, a very brilliant group in Calgary that actually had introduced exactly the same conceptual way of thinking in the context of tree uh, development, Again, these are the kinds of minimal rules that generate these branching structures. And actually, people from his lab actually joined Pixar and generated all of their trees. So anyway, well before 
we'd done anything like this, they were absolutely thinking uh, along the same lines. Okay, so I'm kind of done. Um, you know, so what have, you know, what have we achieved? So, you know, what, what we've shown across multiple branch tissues is that this large scale complex organization, mammary gland, I didn't show kidney, I didn't show pancreas, spared you that, salivary gland, they're predicted, the structures are predicted by a very simple local self-organizing principle based on this branching annihilating random walk. So what have we learned at the cellular scale? Well, I didn't really show you this, but trust me, is that in all of these different cases, this renewal process is generated by renewing cells, we call those stem cells, which are localized at the tip. And actually those are lineage restricted. So they act, or we've got basal stem cells and luminal stem cells that act cooperatively to generate this elongation uh, and stochastic bifurcation. What about the molecular scale, right? So the biologists may be quite underwhelmed because we haven't given them the genes crucial for this, that, and the other. But what we would argue, try to argue anyway, is that this little model, simple model, provides a quantitative platform to begin to ask targeted questions into molecular regulation. For example, what are the niche factors that control renewal at the tips? How does lineage restriction arise? What regulates the balance between, um, uh, what regulates the balance, the fake balance between the different cell types? And what are the mechanisms controlling stochastic branching? We've got a memoryless branching pattern. Right? Where does that emerge? And what are the factors or signals that drive um, arrest? So I'm I'm done. So um, so there's the group, uh, and the the people in bold were actually associated with the branching work in particular. I mentioned uh, Jaco van Rienen and Kalinda. Rosie Sampagna at, at Columbia had generated all of the kidney data uh, that, that I showed, okay? Um, and then I have this slightly, it's a slightly facetious thing, um, but it's useful, I think, for a physics audience. Um, so in spreading these acknowledgements, um, special thanks to reviewer two. Okay, now uh, I gotta be, the reason I put this in so I like, review, I like reviewer two. Reviewer two accepted our paper, okay. But reviewer two is a molecular biologist. And, you know, they looked at our study and they were very critical of our study. And they wrote a sort of magical sentence which really articulates the challenges that, that physical scientists have in biology. You see it straight away, okay. And it's, it's, you know, and I don't want to be critical because, you know, reviewer two was, was actually wrote a really fabulous sentence. Uh, uh, this is a magic line. While the universe is probably right, it's implicitly worth looking at. So, you know, we as physicists were absolutely taught in the top hands ways. If it's simple, it's probably right. And if it's not simple, it's bound to be wrong. But for many biologists, you know, the instinct is that biology is complicated. Someone brings a simple kind of model, a simple framework, and their instinct is to do, be very safe. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. The six months sometime, the question which I really has uh, we had this cut off in the chemistry with Dr. Lopez that led to us that we can a bit of the story to you know, about the book of the book of the book of the book of the book yeah, so that's, that's, um, that's a question which could have a very long answer, and I'll try and find it. So I think it's really great. And actually, again, it really calls on the physics oriented insights.
Ah, ah, right. Okay. So I don't know about the presidency as a, as a question or you know, in a singular situation. We've not studied um, um, uh, uh, branching in the context. Of things. We haven't looked at it in that, but not in, in, the, in the specific context of things. Uh, uh, and maybe this is not a question I'm asking, but one, one of the things that's very nice, these stem cells, that's self-organization, it's a, it's a very robust feature. And one of the features uh, of it is, is that if you take a, a memory fat, uh, what you can do is you can, at an early stage of development, you can graft stem cells into the other side of the fat pad. So you've got ducks growing this way, and you've got graft stem cells into this side of the fat pad, and they also form branches, which now move this way. And we can see that when they need, they stop. It's really a very nice way. But it also illustrates the self organization of the system. You can put in the nucleus and stem cells and that able to reconstitute our branching program, even when they're transplanted into uh, a different environment. You see, you see healing. Don't, don't get us started on healing. Healing, the, the most interesting phenomenon in epithelial biology, I think, in the last I mean, 10 years, but it's the heart of the interest of our lab. It's that uh, the cells which are normally fated for differentiation and loss are uh, under injury conditions reprogrammed. And they can reacquire a stem like a state. So, actually, injury and regeneration is a really simple and complex problem. And actually, our lab, that same thing that we're really it's not to do with branching per se, it's true for all epithelial. The community is discovering it's true for all epithelial. So, injury and regeneration is a whole new, whole new topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no. Okay, so so what I'm saying in this library plan, you've got this. You know, here's a, here's a branch which already exists, a maturing branch, here's an active tip. So when the tip comes into the orbit of that branch, it's inhibited. Potentially, you know, clearly by steric influences, and most likely by biochemical influences as well. Now in the mammary gland, it's, it's all over to this one. The cells exit cell cycle, they stop, it's all over. In the salivary gland, they pause, but as the tissue goes on expanding, so it's like an affine expansion, you know, everything is inflating, new space is created, and it continues to branch. Is that, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what we think is going on, uh, and the statistics of those distributions are consistent with that. And actually, pneumonia, has done some nice intravital imaging uh, in the exoplanets, and you can see that process. Right? So you can follow this branching over over time and see the pause and then the reactivation. <laughs> yes. I Yeah. 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 So I, I, I think you're. 
asking quite a broad question here. And I'm going to interpret this question as why we're we working on mice as opposed to another model organism. Uh, and actually, you know, it, it, it's uh, the facetious answer to this question is because we're mad. And uh, we, uh, and it was a decision I uh, regret. I, I can tell you that our mouse costs, and then I give you a proper answer, our mouse costs are around £10,000 per month at the moment, something, something like this. So really, my, my background is in theory, you know, you just pay the theorists, they do the work, it's great. Uh, and these mice are very expensive. So why mice? Why not other model organisms? Absolutely. There are branching phenomena, uh, you know, tracheal branching in Drosophila. It would be a really interesting problem to look at. Uh, the reason that we are focusing on mice, and we're not focusing exclusively on mice, you can see that we're doing a lot of work on human, um, is that the core focus of the lab is in cancer biology. So we want to get as close as possible as we can to the human system rather than a simple model organism. So we definitely need the system to have an immune system. The immune system is going to be fundamental to what we look at. Uh, you're right, we could work on fish and many people do, but we don't. We've gone for the, uh, a mouse model. So there are many other issues that you raised that I think yeah. origins of life, very interesting, out of my depth, don't know much about that good people when you get a chance you should invite buzz baum to come, come and give a talk and he will tell you about origins of life very cool yeah i can hear you fine so um we make what you said was the sort of like open up a lab on finding relationships to cancer and so on and building on the gentleman's question just now about um mice not self annihilate because of mutations. Have you done any work on mutations that kind of will operate where they proliferate too much? Because I can see more of a link to that. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, um, so Lemonia, who's doing for it, for example, let's keep let's stick to branching because that's what we spoke about. So, uh, so for example, in the context of branching morphogenesis. Um, one of the key oncogenes in branching tissue is KRAS, part of the SMAP kinase signaling pathway. Activation of KRAS is a key oncogene in many different kinds of epithelial tumors, including salivary gland, pancreas, and so on. So Lemonia is looking at activation of KRAS and seeing what effect that has on branching morphogenesis and what effect that has in the adult context. And one of the, uh, one of the manifestations of KRAS activation, it does many things, but one is in, to increase proliferation of the cells. It also softens the extracellular matrix. And so those kinds of perturbations are very much uh, of interest to us. And actually, since you asked the question, it's very helpful to have the background behavior of the normal system as a reference point to ask how the perturbations change the behavior. Yep. All right. Uh, I think we have some more time for questions, but it's a little bit funny to hear you. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Professor.